There we go. Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks so much for taking time to join us. Uh, today, we've got a presentation from Thibaut. So this is the second of our SIMPEG seminar series. Uh, we're hoping to hold presentations uh, every month. And so if you're interested in giving a presentation or if there's someone you would like to hear from, uh, feel free to send us an email. Uh, there's the email that goes out in the um, the SIMPEG newsletter, uh, or you can ping us on Slack or any of the various various channels that we're on. Um, so I will introduce Thibaut. So Thibaut uh, completed his PhD in 2020 at the UBC Geophysical Inversion Facility, where he's now a postdoc. Uh, his research focuses on joint inversion, um, coupled with, uh, the, with the coupling mechanisms of petrophysical and uh, geologic information. He's an active contributor to SIMPEG uh, and the SIMPEG community. And prior to his PhD, Thibault spent some time working with the Quebec uh, Department of Natural Resources and a variety of different uh, geophysical companies. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, Thibault, and I uh, feel free to share your screen. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Lindsay, for the presentation. So, okay. And... Right, and you should see the presentation now. Yes, looks good. Oh, sorry, one more quick thing before Thibaut gets going. Um, we will hold questions to the end, sort of discussion questions to the end. But if you do have any clarifying questions, feel free to unmute and, and jump in or drop it in the chat and, and I can jump in. All right, thanks Thibaut, go ahead. Awesome, thanks, thanks Lindsay. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm giving this presentation from is a traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Muskegon people. And now, so what I want to talk about today uh, is our work here at uh, UBC towards uh, geologic inversion. And in particular here, I want to show you some new materials that I haven't presented before on starting implementing geological rule within geophysical inversion. So adding more and more geology into our uh, geophysics. So what I mean by geologic inversion is here that our objective is to obtain from uh, geophysical, geological and petrophysical knowledge, what has now been named a quasi-geology model. This is a categorical representation of the subsurface which can then be used for interpretation or answer specific uh, geologic question. And so the approach we are taking here at UBC for that uh, is to integrate and make sure that all of the available information is reproduced within the inversion itself. So, that's it. so that means that we're gonna jointly invert for multiple physical properties and multiple uh, geophysical survey at once using the additional information from petrophysics and geology, but also uh, reproduce those petrophysical and geological observer, uh, observation. And so our approach for that is really tying uh, different tools that are already part of the uh, exploration toolkit. So like having geophys uh, and all of them are like um, very advanced in, in their own field, but they're often treated as a uh, separate step. And it's usually very hard to get uh, a unique uh, quantitative representation of subsurface from all of them. So we have the geophysical inversion that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, we, we, we have the petrophysical characterization that uh, I'm a big fan of the work that uh, Randy and King has been doing at the Canadian uh, Geological Survey. And we also have the geologic, geological modeling part. Here I'm showing you pictures, for example, from GEMPI that I'm not going to use today. And I'm still uh, like, it's still something I want to do, but uh, uh, <clears throat> that's going to be for some, something else. And my goals to, for today and the, the focus of my presentation today is going to be to have, start to have some fun with inversion. I'm, all of, what I'm going to show today is really like a proof of concept, but starting to merge geophysical inversion and geological modeling by really starting to input like geology, purely geological concept within the geophysical inversion. And so uh, just, uh, just, to, uh, just as a warm start, I'm just gonna uh, do a refresh on the geophysical inverse problem before we dive into uh, our own uh, joint framework. So the way geophysical inversion problem works to go from 
geophysical observation, sometimes at the surface or in boreholes, to uh, representation of the subsurface uh, in terms of uh, physical properties is through the minimization of uh, that misfit function. And usually we have two parts to that uh, objective function. We have the data misfit, which measure how well our representation of the subsurface uh, fits our geophysical observation. And usually we have a lot more parameters in those uh, geophysical model than we have observation. So we usually add a regularization to add prior information about that model. And usually we have two parts to it. We have a smallness, which measures a minimum, uh, the distance to a reference model, which is your best representation of the subsurface prior to the geophysical inversion. And then we have a smoothness term that ensures that we minimize spatial variation. And now with the now widely available uh, inversion code, uh, here I'm showing like a least square inversion, but DOM has done, done a lot of work also having for sparse inversion. So this is what we like we will get. So here I'm showing three sections through the 3D model, 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 and I'm showing the outline of the geology model that I use to forward those data. And so with one body that's here mainly uh, have a low density and one body that's mainly magnetic here. And so we see that the gravity anomaly and the magnetic anomalies are well centered around the units that gener generated them. But now if uh, we want to do the, the additional step of recovering a quasi-geology model from, that, uh, from, from those two inversions, so meaning like a categorical representation of the surface, things start to be uh, quite hard. And because you see here, for example, if I show the scatter plot of the two inversion, I have a continuous range of values. And I also put on the scatter plot the true petrophysical signatures that I use to generate those data. And we see that we're uh, very far from reproducing those, uh, those petrophysical signatures. And any interpretation I'm going to make here is going to be highly dependent on the threshold I use or the, the, the outcome of any clustering algorithm. So that makes the rock ident identification uh, fairly complicated. And so to find the results, uh, so our goal now is really to find a result that's more geologic. And for that, we uh, require, require to make progress on two different aspects. First, we need the physical pro property value of our geophysical model to, uh, to be associated with a variable rock unit. And in, uh, in addition, we need also a geologic identifier at each location. So that's gonna be our quasi geology model. And so that means that now not only we, do we need to fit the geophys geophysical data, but also the petrophysical and geological observation. And so that's what motiv really motivates us to, uh, um, to create that uh, PGI uh, framework. I'm going to show you an over a brief overview of it, but uh, I'm not planning to go into detail into that. Um, I've, I've done that in some presentation that are already on YouTube, but if you have question, uh, that uh, like that really impedes your understanding. Please interrupt me, and we can I can give you some uh, uh, some more some more insight. So the way we design this uh, PGI framework is as a uh, three interlocked inverse problem. Like so, considering the geophysical inversion, the petrophysical characterization, and the geological identification. Uh, <clears throat> So now our goal is not only to recover a geophysical model that fit our geophysical data, but also a petrophysical distribution and a quasi-geology model. And they, all, they, all, they are all independent, interdependent and interconnected. So they need, they need to fit each other and to fit all of the observation. So it's, a, so it's, it's, it's designed to be able to do joint inversion and uh, so, and really at the core of it, what I'm presenting here, that's really our general formal and flexible framework. And so what we're gonna focus on today is really the geological identification. And I'm gonna highlight in particular, how by just changing one, uh, one pieces of that, of that big complicated puzzle, we can really start to uh, uh, play with inversion and add additional, add additional information that we will not have been able, uh, able to uh, prior. And so if we want to fit petrophysics and geology, we need to, mo to have a way to represent it. We need to model it in some way. And so the way we uh, we implemented uh, 
on our side for, P for the PGI applications uh, was to uh, use uh, a Gaussian distribution so it's, or a normal distribution, so a very common representation in statistics. So what we do here is to represent each geological unit and its petrophysical characteristic as a Gaussian distribution. So for example, here if I have a background unit and I have uh, samples, let's say for density and magnetic susceptivity, I can summarize its uh, I can summarize its uh, petrophysical signatures uh, through the mean and the covariance of the Gaussian distribution. And we do that for all of the rock unit we know about or that we inferred uh, to, <clears throat> in, in our area of interest. And the way we bring everything together is simply by summing those uh, petrophysical signatures. So we really now see uh, physical properties as a probability distribution. And so in that sum, so we have the sum of all of the rock unit and the petrophysical information is gonna be encoded in the, that, um, in that uh, normal distribution. So that's our end all on the petrophysics. But this, on this summation, we, all, we can also weight each, each term. Like, uh, so that's what we, I often refer to as a proportion and that's our geology end all. So what that terms mean is that we can make uh, a particular rock unit more or less likely at uh, at different locations. So we can. So that's our way to uh, add geology information into the inverse problem. And so this function is then what we use to redefine our smallness term in our ge uh, geophysical inversion. And now the goal is to reproduce that petrophysical uh, distribution and also to recover a quasi geology model uh, Z, Z represented by Z here that fits our uh, geological knowledge. So I'm going to start by uh, uh, showing you the case study that we did uh, last year and that show, showcase kind of like uh, the, all of the, uh, most of the tools that we implemented before to, uh, to include petrophysics and geology. And, and then how we can, then after that, we're going to see how we can go further. So this case study is a DO27 Kimberlite pipe in the Northwest Territory of Canada. And so the, for the geological setting, I'm showing here the geology model that was built from bowl only. And so we have like a background with a sedimentary layer and a granitic host rock. We have the main uh, Kimberlite pipe here that's mainly uh, load, uh, lo uh, have a low density. And then we have this dipping magnetic unit on the side here, which is also strongly remanent. So we're gonna use a magnetic vector inversion for, the, for that work. And uh, I'm directly show, going to show you the result of, the, of PGI here. So like this is a joint inversion of the gravity, gravity, gravimetry, and magnetic surveys. And we, inver and, uh, we invert for five parameters. There's a density, the three, the three component of the magnetic vectors, but we also take into account elevation here because it was shown from uh, borehole and samples that there was a strong correlation between elevation and uh, between density and elevation. So we wanted to add that trend uh, in it. And so this is our, the quasi geology model we recovers and the magnetic and the, and the density. So for the magnetic, we see that we were able to encode very well that uh, the uh, one unit was only induced and one unit was remanent. And for the density, we recover very well also the main pipe. Uh, but then we have this northern extension here, and that's where uh, we that's where we saw a problem first with that in, uh, with that inversion is that this extension to the north of the main pipe was not seen from in the borehole model and should have been seen if if it was there. And also we have this small uh, we have this smooth anomaly closer to the surface, and we know from borehole too that. Uh, occurrences of Kimberlite close to the surface were seen that we were not recovering. And so that's now like, and that's what I want to emphasize here right now is that we actually now used the PGI framework to make geologic assumptions about the, the geology in the, in, in the area. So that was kind of our first step on, of including geology here is that uh, from this observation, we actually uh, concluded and make the assumptions that uh, the, the kimberlite occurring outside of the pipe uh, probably had a different signature than the main pipe, which was like have a very low density, almost like minus one of density contrast. So that was pretty, pretty huge. 
So what we did is we, we used the PGI framework to make geologic assumptions. So what we did is we added a new work unit, which will be something that will be very hard to do in a normal Tikhonov setting. Uh, we already had the elevation as a parameter. So we actually used that again to favor that uh, unit in the near surface. And uh, we used our primal knowledge also to uh, estimate density and magnetic uh, signatures of that uh, unit. And so rerunning the PGI inversion with those additional assumptions, this is what we obtained. So we, you see here that we were able to bring back that gravity anomaly back at the top where the, we had the occurrences. And we're still fitting all of the available, available data in terms of petrophysics and uh, geophysics. And so we, we had this improved geological, uh, quasi-geology model at, uh, at the end. And so now I really want to focus on like how we obtain that quasi-geology model. And it's actually built at each iteration. So PGI is really an iterative framework where you do one iteration of your geophysical inversion and then uh, you readjust your knowledge about the petrophysics and then your knowledge about the geology. And really focusing on that part here, what, what, what it does is that when we're given the geophysical model and a petrophysical characteristic that's uh, using that uh, GMM, so that sum of Gaussians here, uh, and the proportions that I mentioned before are included in the geological data here. So what it does is that basically like if you see here is that the GMM is that will, and we have the model here M as a histogram. So what it does is that um, it classifies the unit as the most likely work unit given the physical property contrast at that locations. So like you see here, like the, the, the model on that side will be classified as unit one, which corresponds to that Gaussians. And on the right here, uh, they will be classified as unit, unit two co corresponding to that unit. Like this is just a synthetic. This, is, this doesn't correspond to the true things, but like that's for you to showing the concept. And so this quasi-geologic model is then used for the next iteration to build a new reference model and update the regularization weight for the next iteration. And so you, you saw, we saw with that example that it's working pretty well. But we're actually fairly limited in the amount of information we can input at this stage. Uh, because as I say, we can, uh, like uh, on this previous example, I favored one unit, like north of an area. So I, so I did not uh, overprint the, the pipe, uh, the pipe signatures. But this is a cell by cell classification. So currently, I cannot input any uh, information about the structures of the geology, because this is, a, this is uh, an information that requires you to share information about your, your, your neighbors. So like all of the continuity or the orient orientation of the geological unit is ensured by the smoothness term, which is applied on the physical properties. But there is no reason that should, well, there is some, some reason mathematically because it's a hard, hard problem, but you can also include this information uh, directly on Z, on your quasi-geological model, and so that's what we. And so that's what I'm gonna. Uh, what uh, I'm gonna present next is that how do we represent structural information uh, uh, when, when building the quasi-geology -ge model itself, rather than just acting on the physical properties? So we want to act on the classification itself. And so the way we're gonna include that in our framework is simply by. Uh, changing our pre uh, how we formulate the prior information on the on, on the geology. So that's the only piece I'm going to change in the whole framework, and that's why like, that, that really shows uh, how flexible that can be. So we're going to change that prior formulation to propagate geology information across neighboring cells. And to motivate that example, uh, I created this synthetic example. Uh, this synthetic example. So this is a DC 2D example. So here I show you the electrode location. So it's composed of three layers. So I'm gonna play a bit with stratigraphy and we have a dike on the left and a fault on the right. And so if I run a Tikhonov inversion of the DC data we acquired here, this is what we will, we will obtain, which is by all means uh, very satisfactory. So we have like a slightly more conductive right at the surface we see the resistive unit a bit discontinuous, but it's there. And then we have the dike. We see that it's highly conductive right at the surface, but then 
uh, it's more blobby and less con uh, conductive uh, at the bottom. And now if I run my current PGI uh, framework on that, this is what I will obtain. And um, I'm not very satisfied to be, uh, like, to be honest, but I know why I'm not satisfied. So we see clearly that first layers, even though like we see that close to some electrodes, we have some uh, single or two cells that are isolated and still categorized as uh, the background unit. So if you're in interpreters, maybe you say, oh, those cells are just mis are just misclassified because of uh, the sensitivity or, or whatnot. So, but because we actually, as interpreter, we actually assume like, oh, this unit is continuous. So we need to, uh, so I'm gonna just fill the gap, but we could actually do that in the inversion. Uh, then that discontinuity of the resistive unit is actually enhanced by PGI. And we see that we obtain three, just three individual blobs and also uh, the dike at the at the bottom, like here, we see that we identify it as being the same unit as the top the top unit. So that's another issue. Like we also mislabeled uh, the dike at the uh, at, at depths, and we have a lot like we and we have a lot of things also just in terms of uh, physical properties here. I don't. I just want to mention it because it's important. But I could develop a lot more on that. Is that you see here, for example, we have this conductive unit and then we have the resistive unit, but then we have like the middle background uh, unit in between. And that's because physical properties are continuous. So if, uh, if I'm starting from the top layer unit here and I want to transition to the resistive unit, well, I need to travel through the background things. And because we are doing iterative continuous update, then I'm going to end up with this transition. And that's also what's happening in the bottom here is that we start from the, from the background unit. And if we want to go up to the dike conductivity, well, we need to travel through the top layer. So we're going to try, we try to explain first things with the less contrasting top layer unit instead of the dike. So that's when uh, geology is going to be very important for us to uh, achieve, the, uh, achieve a better result. So for that, uh, I turn to the image, image segmentation world to start implementing uh, geologic rule rules. So in, the whole point of image segmentation is uh, to uh, uh, <clears throat> is to add information on the classification and smooth the classification, if you wish. So here I show you a, uh, uh, a very classic example of image segmentation. And so like on the left, this is the original pictures. And in the middle, this is a classification using a clustering algorithm, a cell by cell. And we see like, especially in the background, we see that the classification is, uh, yeah, like we have some isolated pixels or so on. So, and then we, if we use like an image segmentation approach where we try to smooth out the, uh, the, the, the classification, this is what we will obtain. So. Clusters are much more continuous, as you we can see. Like we can lose some features, like the eyes, but we are we are uh, we are gaining in terms of the, the continu continuity and uh, lower noise in the recovered uh, image. So we are, and so this is done by sharing information across neighboring cells. And so for that uh, for that work, uh, I choose to work with uh, GMMRF. So there are tons of way to do image segmentations. And I just picked one that I was very close to what we did before. And also it's one of the simplest one. And so I can, I, I can, I can try to explain it very quickly. And it's, it doesn't also require uh, any training. So I know which rules I'm implementing with that, with that tool. Like uh, it's not some sort of uh, black box. So, uh, so we know what, so we are able to uh, very easily in, include a lot of different uh, dif different rules as you can see. So in, in the original formulation with the GMM, the way we built the, the quasi-geology model at each cell was uh, we were picking, the, as I said before, the most likely rock unit given the petrophysics and our prior expectation of finding that rock unit at that location. So that's uh, the cell by cell, thing, uh, cell by cell classification. With the GMM ref, uh, so it's almost like the same, but now we have an additional term in our prior information, which depends on the value at the, of the cell you, you're looking at, but also its neighbors. 
and so that so so now we we like we we have this term that's uh, the probability of a certain rock unit knowing that rock unit it's the rock unit around it. So uh, if I want to rephrase it and give an example, for example, it's like uh, I want I want to know the classification at one cells, but that I know that all of the cells around me are, for example, classified as the first layer unit, then I should be more likely to be of that same unit rather than something different. So that's what really what we're implementing. And that's something that is not encoded into a cell by cell classification. And so again, an, an, another choice we made to model that uh, this interaction between neighboring cell is to use uh, pairwise fun uh, potential functions. So here I'm showing you an example with two units. So it's shown usually as a matrix here. And basically what the diagonal terms are, it's the, it's the terms where, uh, for, wh for when two neighbors are the same classification and the off diagonal are for uh, the neighbors are different classification as you see right here. So it's, and it's uh, expressed as the exponential of the temperatures. So what that mean is that if I have like a positive temperatures for the diagonal term, that means that I'm favoring to like neighbors to have similar class. And if that I'm setting those that temperatures to be negative, then I'm encouraging neighbors to be of different classifications. And it's the reverse for the of diagonal term. Uh, so now try, starting to implement something for our, our, our model here. So what, what so we have four units, the background, first layer, second layer, and dike. And so this is how I define those parameters. So on the diagonal, I put something positive. So I'm encouraging neighbors to be identical. So I'm encouraging geological continuity. Uh, on the off diagonal here, looking at the background and the first layers, I'm actually putting something very negative, like pretty, like probability zero. So what, what it does actually is saying like, well, I forbid uh, the background unit and the first layers to be within uh, each other's neighborhood. I'm, so I'm, I'm not saying which unit gonna be between, but I'm just saying like, I know those two units are separated by, by something. And then, this, for, and then the other parameters are null. That means that I'm not neither discouraging or encouraging uh, those configuration in any way. Uh, Lindsay, I, uh, I see a question in the chat. Is there anything uh, to address? No, not at this point. Okay, thanks. Um, so that's how I add stratigraphy information through those parameters. But I can also play on, like I've talked about neighborhood so far, but I haven't defined them. And actually I can, because I have a classification per unit, I can actually add structural information that's particular to each unit uh, when I define those neighborhood. So again, use, I'm using that ident identifiers to be able to include different information at different loca location and change it throughout the inversion. So for example, in that example, for, so I'm defining the neighborhood of the two layered cells, uh, layered unit at the top as being slightly more horizontal. So I'm really looking at having continuities on the horizontal uh, for that one. Uh, for the dike, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm encouraging continuities to be uh, much more like, I'm encouraging like a very thin bodies and at 45 degrees as in my uh, model. And for the background, I actually choose something like more vertical. So a couple of reasons for that. On the, from the probability space perspective, I'm, uh, I'm obliged to use the same number of neighbors. This is not a parameter that I can e easily change. And there is a lot of computational, but also mathematical reason for why I'm using the same number of uh, neighbors for all the cells. And so what I, what I choose to do for that was actually to put something like vertical and what I use that for is actually to uh, set a minimum distance between my background and my first layer unit. So I can test those rules too, like uh, it's a synthetic. So I can try those to apply those rule on my uh, synthetic true model and just check that uh, those rule are, uh, fits with the features of my model. And so applying the set of rules that I just defined, stratigraphy and um, continuity to the true model, this is what I obtained. So you see that I'm not changing anything. 
except in the region of the fault here, because I said that the background and the first layer cannot touch. So we know that this particular kink point, I'm not going to recover it because this is not something that's allowed within the geological rule I, ju I just implemented. Uh, I could also use this rule for a post-inversion classification. Like let's say I run a PGI, I run the PGI and then I define the rule and then I apply the geological rule to modify the quasi-geology model that I obtained from uh, PGI. So like post-inversion imposition. And this is what I will obtain. Well, I guess I recover like a continuous resistive unit. So like I've fixed that problem, but I haven't fixed any problem around the, 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 the dike area. And like, I mean, what's, what started as big blobs right here, like are still there. And I even like some, like some conductive here on the side. And also the problem with the spot inversion is as always, when you do something post inversion, you're not taking into consideration anymore the geophysical data. So there is no reason for the geophysical data to be fit after that process. And that's what's happening here that we've actually increased a lot by uh, three hour misfit from the geophysical data. So now I'm gonna ap actually apply those rules. And so replacing the whole GMM in my PGI iterative framework by the GMM ref. So every time uh, I do go through this iteration, uh, the, the, the quasi geology model I built is gonna uh, respect those rules, but also going to be checked back from the uh, to the geophysical data and the petrophysics. So, including those rules as part of the iterative uh, process, this is what I obtain, and I'm much more satisfied now with the results. So, we see that first of all, the dike is now a dike. That's uh, that's so we we it's, it has, uh, with the uh, the prescab orientation. So that's pretty good. I have a bit of this, uh, again, of that deep resistor on the side with a bit of conductive, but it's not, it's, not, it's not too bad. And the resistive layer is also very well recovered and I still see the fault right here. And the, we see here that the misclassification I was talking at the beginning in the first layers are completely fixed, at least we, like within the core of the survey. I have some issues on the side here and so what's happening here is that ge my geologic rules are pretty strong right here. Like I'm, I'm literally forbidding the background, which is my starting model, to be, uh, to be close to that, uh, uh, to that, uh, to be close to that first layers. And what's happening right here is basically like I don't have much uh, sensitivity in the from the geophysical data to really constrain those sections. So. The, all of the core of the survey is nice, but here, like, like when we are at the side of the DC survey, we, I'm starting to lack uh, sensitivity to the geophys geophysical data to really constrain and have everything in accordance and basically prolong that, uh, that layers uh, up, to the, up to the border of the mesh. Well, the mesh goes further, but that's, that, so that's uh, like that's kind of the main issue I have with that model. But like everything that we wanted to fix, other than that, the dike and the continuity and the continuity of the resistive layers are all fixed. So in summary, so we've added geological rule through iteratively updating the local proportions uh, through the uh, GMM ref. So we added unit continuity, we added stratigraphic ordering, and we have added structural orientation just by acting on that single uh, on that single term in our our whole framework so so that's a proof of concept for uh, demonstrating the imp impact we can have by merging geophysical inversion with geological modeling and so for that we use pgi our formal and flexible framework and i showed that uh, we can change and swipe formulation to add different type of prior information so, and again, I use the uh, GMM ref for the simplicity of its formulation and the easiness to implement a variety of rules without any uh, requirement for training data and training process like a neural net. But of course, geological modeling and mesh implementation are both a wide and active field of research and uh, merging PGI with a different approach will offer different advantage and different tools as well. And, also, I really want to uh, acknowledge everyone 
here in the Simpay community that makes this work possible. And that I'm very glad that we have now at least the main portion of PGI uh, part of the C main Simpay distribution. So a lot, uh, many thanks to all of you for that, and especially uh, Lindsay and uh, Joe for reviewing that massive pull request. <laughs> And I, I give you here also some resources on our work on PGI. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Thibaut. Appreciated your presentation. See some claps coming in. Um, we're a small group today, so I would encourage folks to just unmute and, and jump in. If we got people talking over each other, we can <laughs> switch to the raise hand, but I, I'd encourage folks to just jump on in. Uh, Thibaut, great talk. I really enjoyed it. I was a little bit late, but I enjoyed most of the point. Um, I was curious, like, uh, what's the set of rule to set the variance of your, uh, like, a physical property? So the question that I'm, the reason I'm asking this, it's somewhat like, a, so if you think about the true earth, the variance in physical property really will be pretty large. So if you think about, like a sampling a point, and then measuring a resistivity, and then thinking about that like in a 3D volume, generally the variance of uh, your physical property value will be pretty large. But what we're measuring in geophysics is not some sort of average of that. So likely the variance will be reduced. So now you're actually in like using that as a prior information. So I was actually curious, like uh, what's your thought on that? And also what is your general rule of thumb to actually set the variance of your GMM for each, uh, each kind of cluster? It's a very nice question, Sogi, and I wish I had a better answer than uh, try, uh, try and retry sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, you get the, like it's a uh, couple, like couple of, like couple of things. It, it, you can also try to uh, set it to your, uh, like, uh, Set it a bit to your goal. Like so, like the variance in the GMM. Uh, if I go way back in in something like that, so like the, the petrof like the GMM, like the covariance of that GMM, like it's your, it, it's the same as your geophysical noise, but now it's your petrophysical noise. And so, so you want to fit it to a certain to up to a certain level. So something like. After that, if, if you want, if you know, like for in the case of TKC, we know that things were, we have like, we're like fa fa uh, fairly contrasting, like uh, with the main, with the main body, uh, like all of the sample were at least uh, a contrast of minus 0 0.8 to minus, to minus 1.2 or something. So we're like very strong contrast. So we, and, and the, and the background was said to be very, uh, very uh, un uniform. So like, I set the variance for the background to be very small, for example, and something larger for, for, the, for, for the main pipe. But I was dis distinct enough because it had such a hard contrast. For, for this example, I just put the same variance for everyone, pretty much. That's, so that kind of like a, that was kind of something that works well. Or, and that also works well when you have like a lot of units like this. So, like you, you want like uh, the variance gonna also change like your your like the area of uh, impact of each unit. So it's kind of it can get uh, a bit complicated, but uh, for yeah. So like uh, I usually take into account what the the variance from the uh, from the sample if I have, and also like uh, like. If I don't know, I will usually start with like all of the same variance and run the inversion and see the result will get me something that's fairly reasonable. And I will see like if I can tighten some, some things. Oh, there is also the way, the tool where you can let the algorithm learn the covariance. So there is that tool, like not only the mean, but the covariance, but uh, <clears throat> it requires a bit more uh, it, uh, fine tuned, like uh, you need, the thing is like you, you want you you want to leave when you will learn it you want to uh, you want to to leave it some uh, some liberty but you don't want also like to say like oh the noise is is very large so I'm fitting everything but because I'm just setting things that are very, like noise that is very large so 
the, yeah, there is a balance for that as well. But starting from the plate of physics is usually nice, and then you you see with the inversion if you uh, what you can uh, what you can refine. And again, if you want to recover things that are very sharp, put very sharp covariance and contrast. If you want, if you know that things are very smooth, you can also recover things that are. You can also increase your variance to for certain units to have something that's very smooth. Like uh, I don't. I don't know if you still see the presentation. I still see. Okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking of that uh, example right here where like I have the bag I have the background here, like I have the resistive units that have a small variance, but like the 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 conductive one has a much larger variance, and that's to accommodate the fact that it was like smooth in the uh, in the synthetic model. So Generally, for a kind of default, would you start with like a relatively small variance uh, rather than having a large variance? It's like a, if you are getting a large variance, you're basically getting back to a smooth inversion. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Timo. Yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah. So, like, uh, as a first try, I would say, like, uh, well, it depends also of your. Of your contrast, but I would say like something like this is kind of nice to work with, and you like or basically set like your vi like like because you imagine like here the variance uh, like works well together, but if the contrast were much smaller, they would still overlap. So if you want things that are still sharp but not to overlap, I would say like put your variance to be like uh, maybe like a quarter of your. Uh, physical property contrast, and that's that's a pretty first good guess if you if that's in accordance with what you know about the petrophysics as well. Dom, I see you speaking, but I can't hear you. You're not muted, so I'm not too sure what's going on. Um, can you, you're good now, yeah. yeah Thibault, yeah. Um, can you go back to the, um, to your kernel? So you had like little like uh, drawings of how you're measuring your neighbors. Uh, you know, you had like your dike, you're just, yeah, yeah, 32. Yeah, slide 32. 32, next one. Yeah. So uh, how did you pick those? And uh, yeah, that's interesting because, you know, I, I tried to do a directional, you know, gradients, that kind of stuff. So how did you come up with those? And uh, I oh, guess those, want... those are totally adjustable, right? Yes, they're totally adjustable, like uh, in the, the way I implemented that uh, GMM ref uh, class. But in the background, I'm using a KD tree. So I uh, like a nearest neighbor. Yeah. With a number of neighbors. Yes. And, but a, then, uh... and, and an anisotropy. So basic, so... Okay. So each basically each unit has its own KD tree. So the, and so and I look it up and like the KD tree instead of using like instead of using the row X Y Z yeah like well you, you train the KD tree on the Stretched. on the grid on the grid CC on the cell centers of the mesh right yeah but I just multiply that grid that uh, uh, that those cell center coordinate by an anisotropy and then train the trains the KD tree on that uh, anisotropy times the cell centers. Huh, and that's, that's how, smart. Yeah. And that's how I obtain different uh, neighbor, neighborhoods. And for the, the diagonal one, you basically just put it on a plane. You just slap it all on the a, on a, on a XY plane, basically, so that all the neighbors are, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, oh, well, I, cool. ju I, I just I, I just use diff like so it's a two D mesh. Stretch, so like yeah. my my anisotropy matrix is a two by two, and so like uh, yeah, so for that the, makes sense. Yeah. So for it. the dike, I think the way I built it was just like uh, you know like a rotation matrix times the scale times the rotate like the inverse of the rotation matrix and just define that and pick a, and pick the angle for that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. That makes sense. Okay, so obviously uh, my second one is thirty-five. Right, we'll want to fix. Uh, we'll want to fix what's happening on the edges of the uh, of the inversion yeah. there. Uh, I have a hard time understanding. I mean, I understand why it puts like 
high values at the edges because it can't touch the uh, the background. So it puts like a boundary there. But I don't understand because it, it seems such a high complexity. How? Why was it not just better just continuing with the green unit on top and the blue unit at the bottom instead of putting some like high like high stuff to close the edge? Because you were still we're still within the survey area there, you know. Yeah. Any idea? Yeah, uh, well, at the same time, also, it's like we like we say that Zeus unit, like they, like Zeus too, like so they cannot be in, in each other's neighborhood. So like with that, that in the background, yeah. we, with the background that set up like a minimum distance on the, in the, on the Y axis. But on this one, like you cannot have the background in like, yeah, within five cells as well on the horizontal. And I think that's probably what's also playing with that is that even if we go here, like that probably push it further so yeah like there is it's it's competing it's uh it's uh but in terms of model complexity right it would be it would be a lot it would seems it would be a lot cheaper to just keep going right <laughs> it would you would still respect your rules and it would still fit the data because it is is this model so why do we have to revert to those like <laughs> is it because your reference model is too hard are you pushing too hard on the ref ref background i'm guessing the background value is your ref but uh yeah that's i think that's probably what's happening and like we update the reference model at each time so like if we we kind of like add that com uh, model complexity within the regularization after that so it's not why are you building your ref oh that's that's kind of the way if you, like uh pgi oh, works where you, it works where you, right, right, right. you modif yeah, yeah, yeah. modify your your reference model at each iteration of course of course of course okay yeah hmm. It's interesting. It, it, it's a complicated problem. I mean, we have three inverse problem interlocked and like sometimes they, like most of the time they work together, but it, I have to admit that on that very side, side thing, it, they, they competed. But the, if all the data are still fit, like the, geo, like the geophysical data are fit even with that model. So at some point it's like, yeah, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I see. <laughs> yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's good. Well, I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's awesome to see uh, directionality. Yeah, that was that was different. That's definitely a step forward. That's awesome to see. Good job. So one one comment there. I think you should put the DOI there. I guess because I think it'll make a pretty big difference how the image looks like. Because yeah? it's pretty obvious that uh, below the DOI, that's why you're getting up this big wall. Which is like where we go pretty low sensitivity. Yeah, I yeah, I, I had computed it. I agree, it's not on the side. And like, uh, it was doing something like this. So I mean, uh, uh, like this dike, like the, the like maybe right at the bottom here, but the dike is still still within the DOI. Yeah. It's conductive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Following up on Dom's question, do you think shrinking the number of neighbors might help sort of reduce that complexity near surface? Yeah, why do you have to go to so many neighbors? Why not just the next neighbor over like a gradient, like our gradient operator? That's good, good point, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think, yeah. Maybe remove the things on the side, like uh, like uh, the thing. I think what I wanted to do with that was that uh, set kind of like a, as I say, like a minimum distance between the back, like the top layers and the background. So it part it's like you see here. We don't recover the resistive layer everywhere. So like if I put like one cell around, I probably will end up with a one cell or two cells, uh, like uh, two cells uh, deep. Uh, resistive. So I think it was kind of a way for me to uh, encode like a like a minimum a minimum thickness for that resistive layer. So like it's another form of geologic information, if you wish, using the neighbors to set like the um, the minimum size of a unit. But uh, yeah, there is um, there is a lot of new knobs to play with for sure, and I, I'm I'm not pretending that I know the effect of all of them. <laughs> 
No, that's a good place to be in. Lots of interesting questions to follow up on. It's 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 really an example to have fun as well with the inversion. Uh, like uh, if we want that like to be more like a production style thing, there is a lot of work to do before that. I'm more confident about the PGI and GMM thus far. Like uh, this this one is uh, like uh, yeah, work in progress and playing with it. You got a good question from Jap in the in the chat, Thibault. Okay. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I, I see you have three parts, and I wonder how you weight them in terms of the uh, importance of the misfit. Mm, that's a very, that's a very good question. So, I didn't talk about uh, about that. Uh, but the way we. Uh, the way it works actually is that so our so like the geology and petrophysical information is encoded within the smallness term of the inversion, right? So similar thing as for the uh, uh, geophysical data where we have a we have a, a target misfit, like so. And if we have a formulation as I sh show, uh, like I show here, of like one half of a least square, we usually like the target misfit for the geophysics is going to be number of data divided by two. And for now we have, I have a target misfit for the smallness because the smallness is my measure on how well I measure, on how well I fit both the geology and the petrophysics. And so that target misfit is now number of parameters divided by two. And, uh, and the way after that, like it's, it's set, it actually works kind of like, a, like similar to uh, the usual uh, geophysical inversion problem. So it's still a geophysical inverse framework in a way that um, we still have like uh, this. Let's go back to right at the. We still have a similar formulation like this. So we start we start with a high beta and we cool it cool it down until we reach the geophysic the geophysical data misfit. And after that, I have different strategies for. Uh, reweighting the smallness term to the alphas or the, or, the, or the weights. And the goal is to reach both the target misfit of the geophysics and the target misfit of the petrophysics. And the way I do it usually is like start fitting the geophysics first and then warm up the petrophysics and geology to while keeping the, while, while keeping the geophysical uh, misfit uh, stable. Right, because I could imagine you weighted according to the confidence you have in your data. So you have seismic data with a lot of noise. If it's noisy, you won't trust it. You give it a lower weight. And if you have you know, your doubts about the geological model, then you give that also less weight. Is that the way you can do that? Yes, so I do that in terms of the, um, in, for the petrophysics and the, so, what I didn't talk, I didn't use it that tool into this uh, talk because, like, it was not the focus. But uh, the idea is that uh, this petrophysical characterization uh, inverse problem is here uh, when we don't know uh, the when we don't know the petrophysical information or if we have we have no confidence in it. Like, uh, so what it does is that uh, we have the petrophysical uh, data or like uh, like a, what we think the GMM looks like as a prior information and it imp as an input it takes the geophysical model and what it does is that it's gonna uh, it's more complex than that but it's basically gonna average what it sees in the geophysical model and what you saw from your petrophysical data so an example that I that I have here on the side is that uh, imagine that at a certain iteration, my geophysical model M, the histogram looks something like this. But from the petrophysics, what we saw uh, from uh, what uh, from the petrophysics, what we saw as a GMM was this dashed line right here. So then we are learning a new GMM distribution. So that's a what's I call, that's map EM uh, algorithm that I'm using, and. It's, so it's going to learn this uh, with the outcome going to be this uh, black uh, this GMM in black right here. So it's averaging it's an average uh, between what it sees in the geophysical model and what you saw in the in the um, in the petrophysics. And you can weight that with and that 
indeed what I call my confidence in my petrophysics. And sometimes if I have no information about the petrophysics, well, my confidence is zero. <laughs> and but you can still use that. And I think I have a, I've kept the slide of an example for that. Uh, a DC example with two cylinders. So uh, if, I, if I knew the petrophysics perfectly, like in terms of the means, this is what we obtain. And we see, okay, fine, we recover it. But that last panel is, is one where, again, it's a very cool geologic assumptions to be able to make is that I'm using PGI to make the assumptions there is three distinct units, but I don't know anything about the petrophysical signatures. And I let the algorithm with that map EM step to learn at each iteration, uh, a, a proper GMM, and that's the final outcome. So I underestimate the true uh, contrast, but I recover the right shape and it's and the, 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 and the top. So it still gives me a lot of information and I'm able to build a quasi geological model from that. Yeah, thanks. So I, a very attractive way of doing it, I must say. So thank you very much. Have you tried to run like that um, dike model with the purposely the wrong uh, regularization to see how it turns out? Because you you are almost giving it the known yeah. answer, and so it'd be interesting to see how you know those models turn up. If you either give it more flex or you think it's at a thirty degree you know, mm -hmm. slope sort of a 45. So that'd be uh, interesting to in investigate how accurate do your um, things you need to feed it. Sorry, I'm, words oh, yeah, no, are I escaping see, me. It, it's a great idea and I should, and I don't have it on the slide on the slide here, but uh, uh, actually I think the structures was, um, instrumental in the in this result like uh, if i if i didn't put any structures in the classification uh like um, you're building it at each iteration and uh especially at the start like sometimes it, it doesn't know how like it, like it, like there was a lot of like um yeah it was hard to for the to pinpoint like some uh, some uh, for the from the result if things they were like flat or not so it was so adding the structures was actually, uh, yeah, very useful and important to get uh, a, a good result. So I haven't found it with a dike uh, at like a, at the wrong angle, but I did run it without any structures, and re results were really not as good. <laughs> yeah, it, it would just be interesting to know how correct if you can get it close or if you need mm -hmm. to be like bang on with your like structural in information to get a result that looks right. And then I guess yeah. the other add on I've done this in previous work is um, in Simpag, this might be a question for the greater community. Can you cut like the smoothness on like a, a her horizon? You know, if you know, you know, these steps or you know the dike you know, in other inversion stuff, you can cut the smoothness reg regularizations. You can say there's a sharp con contrast and that would be, if I wasn't, uh, that's one thing I would, I don't know, code up if I had a postdoc or a bunch of free time, so. so. I, I, I think that currently you can't. So I actually had to implement, I haven't pushed yet. It's, it's a very simple implementation, but uh, the current SIMPEC cannot do, but well, I'll, I'll push that soon. I ha actually have used that for my own. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fun, especially if it comes with a knob, instead of just saying yes or no, if you can say how much of a cut you want to do, but it also tends to get unstable. I've tried it on dikes, where if you cut it on both sides, it, in my experience in different codes in Sim, SIMPEC, I'm not, you know, um, it can tend to blow up or get unstable. And so you you really have to be sure when you draw the line that you want to draw the line before just putting in a bunch of geo art and getting crazy. Yes, implementation is not hard, but actually getting, so what <laughs> the difficulty in, in real world, so we're using a basically a tensor mesh or octane mesh. So you actually need to figure out what is the, like where this actual interface is 
which we call face. And then you need to assign a certain number, either zero or one, where you could put a very small or large number. Uh, so in theory, it's pretty simple, but in practice, it's not necessarily trivial to, to implement that or like apply that, I guess. So, so. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> it's for sure tough. I don't want to say it's, you know, no, but, but what, what you're suggesting is what we are doing sort of with controlled seismic uh, control source EM is where we try to use the seismic to get the sort of container of the resistivity. And then we sort of do the inversion for the electromagnetic data. And so we say all the resistivity should be within that particular container. So that could also be done here that you, from seismic, you get the shape of this dike, maybe, I don't know. And then you'd say, well, for the main part, the resistivity should be in that particular shape. Is that a way to do it? Uh, sort of. I think uh, that's some people do, like sometimes they call seismically guided or constrained inversion. So you basically allow a jump at the interface that you have found from the seismic horizon. So that's what basically Thomas asked for us, like, can we do that in SIMPAC? Yes, thanks. Which I'm surprised we, we don't have, right? The face weights has been at UBC for so long and yeah, we never implemented I, it. I was actually trying to find some references and actually had a hard time. Like uh, from UBC group, there's no base. Well, Nick, Nick Williams thesis would have been all over, all over that stuff, right? Ah, perfect. Yeah, just look at uh, Williams PhD. Uh, so if nobody have a question, Timo, yeah. I'm kind of curious, like it's a more big picture question. So what you have shown is like a relatively small example, like uh, mm -hmm. the size of the domain is about maybe a kilometer maximum. Then, but the, the, the data that we get sometimes, it could be huge, like it could cover hundreds of kilometers. What do you like a kind of like a, so the current example like you have basically relatively good knowledge about the geology and physical property but now you are faced with really large data where geology could be completely complicated there could be many geology units and physical property could vary a lot so like a, in such a case like a, do you think that your framework could still be useful and if then how would you how would you use it like, I don't know about that geological modeling part. As I like, I want to emphasize again. Like this, this is me having fun and playing with the uh, with uh, with the inversion. And I think it's a great proof of concept of like there is potential that you if you mer like is that merging geological modeling and geophysics and petrophysics, you obtain a lot of information. Uh, after that, like as I say, I choose a simple model for the geology. So. And in image presentation and geological modeling, there is a ton of different tools. And I think what blocked me, for example, like not blocked me, but like something that will need to be done, for example, if you were with GEMPI, like they use, they use fairly well geological uh, data, but you also need to have as an input your, geo, your physical property model. So that's something like, that's a top of input that will be need to be added. And we can define that in ter in, again, in the probability world and so on. So that's, you need more things. So this this implementation was like, as I say, like fairly straightforward extension from the from the GMM. Uh, but on the la but on the large scale things, uh, as I don't see like the, the the let's say the regular PGI of like uh, with the GMM uh, and going uh, on the la on the large scale. Maybe you want to. Maybe you want, you just want to have like a, a certain number of of, di of different units, but you don't know the petrophysics, and that has been very well tested to learn to learn uh, uh, to uh, learn the petrophys a petrophysical model with different units. So that's. Uh, uh, and I think and, I think we here you just need to experiment without the directionality, right? Just look for neighbors, but like a square, like a square template or something that you know you're mm -hmm. not enforcing anything particular, and see how different from the straight up GMM. Because I can foresee that this is going to be superior, right? Because now mm -hmm. you're asking for continuity. That's what we always want: is things that are flat, right? So, oh, yeah. I, actually, that's a good point, Dom. Is that just the continuity is actually like. 
like just adding the continuity in the classification is something that I would almost feel comfortable to make a pull request out of that. It, it uh, should be standard almost over the GML, yeah. I, I would think, but uh, and, yeah. And, and the, when you would just want to do continuity, like the, uh, I've implemented it with a, still a GMM ref, but not that pairwise thing. So it's actually like, a, it's a, like that's the same algorithm that uh, I implemented from that paper. Like, and it's a, it's a GMM ref, but like they have like, a, it's a, the paper is, is mentioned like to be fast and robust image segmentation with G, GMM ref. And I, I've implemented it and I've, I will feel confident to put that on a pull request for the using GMM ref. And, and I think that's also emphasized that the big things in that example is the stratigraphy thing. And that's actually a ma like this, this is a, for this is a, like I'm forbidding two units to be within each other. So that's a very strong constraint that you might want to maybe to re like if you were somewhere else to relax or so on, but that's an extremely strong constraint. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we could relax with the off diagonal, right? Just say like it's gonna be minus one and one on diagonal. Like they can overlap, they can touch each other in a different order. If you don't know anything else, right? But the fact that these that they're continuous, that they're touching each other, that's that's pretty good. Sounds mm -hmm. pretty good. Actually, I f yeah, I had the slide right here where like I run the PGI, but oh, in continu continuity only. And that's uh, you see that's what the that, what difference that makes. So like especially at the surface right here. Maybe yeah. a bit more of the, the of the of the hey. continuity for the resistive one. Getting and on a better track, yeah, it's getting further. Yeah. Closer, and that one is also much faster to 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 run. Like uh, the the GMM ref with the stratigraphy is actually like I have a, I have a lot of tricks of my up my sleeve to to make it happen fairly quickly. But it's still some something. It's still a, like a it's still a consequent problem. While this one. Uh, everything can be vectorized and it's fairly straightforward to get. Right. Like on an interpretation standpoint, I like this result better than the actual the last one, right? Because <laughs> even though you, you need to think about it, the dike, it's probably a dike. At yeah. least you, you're not getting extra like anomalies that could be that people would be like, mm, is there another like uh, conductors there, right? I mean, uh, it's better to be simple, I think, at this instance, if you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's fair. As I said, like also, I wanted to show like impact of geological modeling, so I went very heavy on the like implementation of rules and as for, for for that type. So like we can really make an impact on which what we recover at the end. <laughs> I see there's a comment from Diane in the chat. Diane, would Oops. you like to jump in? Yeah, I was just just sort of regarding what you're talking about with the larger scale and knowing less about the geology. I was just mentioning that I remember when we were using VPMG at Mira, you know, I, after, after years of trying to implement it in the best way possible, it always kind of made sense to me in the end to start really broad, like two ge geological units and sort of like define those domains and then find the heterogeneity within those domains. And when you were doing your talk and talking about like, um, you know, you've got four different units here. I was also wondering, you know, can you do the same thing? Can you start with just two units? Like the, the conductive overburden and then the background, for example, and then like define that horizon and then say, I have no idea like <laughs> in detail how this stuff <laughs> works, but. But, and then just sort of like introduce, you know, on top of that, like set that sort of as a reference model and then introduce on top of that, you know, heterogeneity or the, like the resistive layer and the, the most conductive layer. But yeah, no, start more, is it possible to do it that way? Like start more simple and then introduce, you know, two other physical property domains and then force it to choose where, where yeah. it's close to those. So not, not automatically. I don't know how VPMG works. I don't have much experience with that software, but I mean, manually, we like uh, we, we definitely can. And that's one thing that I'm like proud and that I really want to advertise PGI to be is it's a it's a tool to make geologic assumptions with geophysics. And I really want to emphasize that that PG, that's how I see kind of PGI. It's, I'm not trying to replace Tikhonov or anything, but it's a it's a good tool to make 
geologic assumptions and test it with geophysics. And uh, like here, it's obviously it's a synthetic example, so we know everything from the start and so on. But uh, I'm just gonna point again to TKC where we dealt with uh, like the real case study and. We started from what we know from the pipe of like having that main unit and the and so the PK and the uh, HK unit for magnetic. So we had we started our inversion with uh, with with three units, and then we got that result and that extension of of the at depths of the pipe, which was not geologically realistic. And so we're like, okay, let's make an assumption and let's add a fourth unit that has not been identified as a distinct unit from Prior, so like it was identified as a kimberlite, but not, and put in the same bin as a, the as a pipe, but not, it was not like characterized as something different. So like we we added we added another unit from our knowledge and the previous result, and uh, yeah, I definitely see that on the large scale you can do a similar approach of like run it with three units, uh, like look at look uh, look at what you get then. Uh, define an, an additional unit and maybe uh, put some constraint on it like we did like near surface and limited to the north of the pipe so we don't want to overprint something that we like and uh, yeah you can definitely iterate on that and use it with that yeah. I, I That's right. I let the geophysics speak right like yeah. <laughs> we're always joking about uh, or you know maybe it's not maybe it's serious but uh, how geology maps are you know you're not your best guide sometimes and the, you know let the geophysics speak its truth <laughs> and tell you a little bit about what's there have you ever visited the kc uh, Thibault, with the uh, pgm around uh, you know, doing the same same idea that Diane just talked about, right? Like start like two units, see how it goes, introduce another unit because that's another free parameter in, in the whole process, right? It's the number of the number of units and number of clusters at the minimum you need to impose. So, yeah. have you have you revisited TKC? No, no, I haven't revisited. That would be interesting, right? If you could uh, swap, if you could get rid of the whole like uh, position of the boundary of that thing and just say, now be continuous, you know? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, because that was a huge problem with this with this guy, right? We need to have like a spatial boundary of the unit two. Yeah, to say, like you can see it because otherwise that unit was well, it was acceptable. Like we had a lot of discussion on that, but like we had that like uh, PK minus being basically at the top of the pipe and then the and then the pipe. But uh, like so maybe you could have filled like those few cells right at the surface here where we don't identify the pipe here. But like we 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 wanted to have we really wanted uh, this PK minus to be uh, a representation of what's happening outside of the pipe. So that's why we, we put that boundary, but indeed that, 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 that could be uh, one way, another way to address. Not, yeah, not just sure, what, I, not sure yeah. what I will get. And maybe yeah. I will need to add some continuity also, like maybe more vertical for the dike, for the pipe and more, more horizontal for the top layers. I don't know. <laughs> Worth trying. You're already all prepped for it. Just throw it in the machine. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Thibaut. This was a great presentation. And thanks, everyone, for the discussion. Um, I think that's what makes these uh, exciting seminars to be a part of, is hopefully every everyone gets something out of it. Um, and so next month, Zhao Long will be given the presentation. So we'll circulate his uh, abstract and bio in the in the coming weeks. Um, but in the meantime, if anyone has further questions for Thibault, feel free to drop them into the seminars channel on Slack and we can continue conversation there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well done, Thibault. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye.